up? Welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and we call this the Studio Q Show Live. And if you're watching it live, cool, welcome. We are, you can watch it afterwards on YouTube. We're streaming out on all these platforms, Facebook, YouTube, all you guys. Yeah, you're jumping in now. Here comes the Facebook crowd. They're piling in, or I mean the YouTube crowd. If you're on Facebook and you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question, um, be sure to allow StreamYard to use your username because it just shows up as Facebook user. And we like to, we're, we're a small enough crowd, we like to keep it personal. So welcome today to this wonderful broadcast. We're going to have a, a great show today, I think. We're going to have um, a couple of folks in here showing some uh, wet plate work, which is always nice. It's always nice to break it up, see what other people are doing, how they're working, what they're thinking about, and also, you know, to address what we can address on the social media platforms, the whole, you know, typing and trying to convey ideas and emotions, it's impossible. So a great show with that. We got um, a couple of, uh, a couple of um, 19th century pieces to look at as far as the uh, literature goes. I'm just gonna jump in here and pull that up. We'll, we'll show our little uh, our little what's on the agenda today slide here. Give me just a second, pull this up, share this tab over. And I've got uh, I've got the guests today, the, the artists showing their work um, already in the queue. So I'm just gonna share my screen here and we'll just get started. We got enough people in here now that uh, Go ahead and view that large. So there we are. Um, and what we'll do is this is what we're going to do today. We're going to look at technical q and A. I I got a couple of technical uh, emails. Actually, Gerard, I'm going to include yours in here. I got some really interesting tidbits from I read the primary literature all the time, right? I No offense to anyone. Please don't take this as an offense. I like to read. The primary. I like to read the originator's work, right? Not contemporary stuff for the fact that they worked in this stuff 24 seven, you know, so they knew how to manipulate and operate it. Some of it's misleading, but there's a couple of good tidbits of information in there. And then the photo critiques. Um, I appreciate you guys coming in. That's very, very uh, nice to share that with the community or, or share your work with the community. Hello, Will and Linda. Good to see you guys. Uh, Linda is Sweden and Will is in Erie, PA. That's good to see you guys coming in. And then we're going to go ahead and do the recommended reading and recommended watching. And what I've done this week is I've tied in this whole idea of um, talking about your work and looking at work and all that stuff. So it should be a good should be a good time. So let's let's get on with it. So here's Gerard. Um, your email about, uh, well, you can read it there. Where, where he's talking about, he made a fresh batch of solid collodion, um, uh, ODB, okay? Immediately after pouring the collodion, I noticed the collodion later dried with a different structure than I was used to. That's, that's, that's the key right there, right? So when I read emails, I look for keywords. I look for, uh, you know, sometimes I have to poke and prod, but I look for keywords. So that's the first one. Um, it looked a tiny bit like the extreme example last week on your Facebook page where the topic starter had used grain ethanol with 40% water. That's right. He used a, an ethanol. I think he's in California. I can't remember the gentleman's name. But um, he used ethanol alcohol that had 40% water in it. And you could tell right away what was up. So you saw that happening, Gerard. So you were, you were connecting the dots already there. Um, the result after developing was clearly visible, so I made another plate using much older clothing, still had a bottle. Great move. So what he did is he went back and he, he, he took a baseline and known consistency and did it again. It worked fine. Poured a plate. And in fact, I was surprised it still worked as good as it did. Exactly. That's a great methodology, Gerard. That's a very, very good methodology. Hello, Maureen from Boston. Saludos. Uh, oh, saludos. See, there you go, Facebook users. Saludos, Pablo. Look, Pablo, you're getting a shout out, brother. There you go. Um, anyway, welcome, whomever that is. 
The chlorine I used for the new batch as well as the grain ethanol were from bottles about two years old. Here's, here's the catch, right? He kept it in the cooler at 4C. That's perfect, beautiful. The question I have, is it possible for ethanol to have attracted so much water over these two years from opening and closing the bottle that it, it, he's asking, is alcohol, does alcohol attract water? And that's a great question. And you're right, you were on point with that because at the end of the day, what we have, we're going to learn a new word. If you don't know what the word is, we're going to teach it to you here. It's called hydroscopic, meaning that, and alcohol is infamous for this. It's very famous in, in a bad way for this. It sucks in the water out of the air. And if you live in a humid area, i.e. the Netherlands, Germany, any of the low countries, you know, the, any, anywhere you're right there by the sea or have a lot of uh, uh, humidity in the air, you will absorb water. So alcohol is infinitely hydroscopic. That means it will, it wants to bring in water as much as it can. So keep this in mind. I'm so glad you brought this up because um, this is a common problem. And he sent me the image and you can, I've, I've overlaid an enlargement here on this. You can kind of see, let me, do I have my tools here? Oh, let me see here. No, I don't have my tools. Okay. Oh, wait, I do. I thought I had my little, no, I don't. Okay, I used to have a pointer on here. Anyway, you can see the little cell structures. I, I've blown that up and increased the contrast on his plate that he sent. The, the rear one is kind of from far away, but I've enlarged it. You see those little cells, those little, we call them chamber lines or, or it, it, this look tells you there's water galore in the collodion. There's too much water in the collodion. So what does too much water do? What does it do? It creates this look and feel. And then it also weakens the collodion. Remember last time we talked about uh, the primary literature says water is injurious to collodion. Too much water is injurious to collodion. That's, that's what happens here. Thank you, Gerard, for this. It's a great thing to put out in the community and show that this can happen. You resolved your own problem. You answered your own question. I just kind of refined it a little bit. And this is the word that you want to look for, hydroscopic. And in your own language, I, I don't know, and you know, not a lot of people, English is our primary language here. So find out what that word is in your 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 language and look at it and define it that way, and you'll you'll see what, what I mean here. So how do you remove water? That's the question, right? Um, I'm gonna answer Gerard's question. He didn't ask that, but that would be the logical next step. I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, we're gonna it's it's gonna blow your mind too. No, nobody's ever talked about a couple of things that I'm going to talk about today in collodion. That's one of them. How do you remove water from collodion? I've had people that dissolve too much salt making their collodion or dissolve too, too much, use too much water to dissolve their salts for their collodion. And they end up with these crepey lines, chambered marks, cells, all that stuff, too much water in your collodion. How do I fix that? My collodion's made. How do I resolve that? We're going to talk about that. I'm going to show, or I'm going to talk about how you do that. How do you remove water from collodion? I told Paul, I'm not sure where, where Paul is from, but I told Paul that I'd talk about this problem today. This is a very weird, unique thing. And I have to preface this uh, and, and, and throw a little disclaimer in here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult, almost impossible, when you send a photograph to someone, whether it's next door or around the world, and, they, and you say, hey, what's wrong with this? There are so many variables that you have to start a very high level and work down and try to resolve these things. And I'll say this right now. These marks, these, uh, we can almost call them sweeps, um, come at erratic times in various forms, and you're going to see a, excuse me, you're going to see a couple of them here. And that's why I said I'd address this. We're actually going to use text out of Burgess's book today that we're looking at to talk about this. But so you see his his uh, commentary there. It happens once in a blue moon. Um, this happens to be happened between two clean plates. I spent yesterday trying to recreate it. Uh, I thought it was not waiting long enough for the ether to evaporate from the plate. So, but I can't replicate it. Personal variant of old workhorse collodion, two weeks old and silver bass pH three. So just keep in mind those marks, right? 
here's Jack's uh, plates. Uh, these beautiful, I think they're gorgeous. These are in Lebanon, the cedar trees in Lebanon. Um, I think it's really cool in the sense of uh, visuals of how these roots formed on the dark side of this, the plate there. This is the same type of problem, right? Just a different application. So what we're talking about here, we're talking about a silver bath that's saturated with alcohol or a developer that doesn't have enough alcohol or too much alcohol and this resistance, when the plate goes down after it's sensitized into the collodion, fighting that uh, double decomposition where it forms the halides, right? That's what creates these marks and lines. Then sometimes we'll talk about this might be him pulling out the plate too soon. And that's how you get these. Uh, I love this kind of Van Gogh starry, starry night on the left and these roots of the trees on the right. I know we're not talking about that. We're talking about technical problems. But you have to admit Sometimes these artifacts work in the favor of the photographer. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so there's a couple more examples of a similar problem. And here's one of mine that I shared with him. You see that line that's cutting off Abel's neck right there? You can see how the plate was sensitized. What happened? There's a little strip there that the silver and the uh, was barred from the plate to do this double decomposition where it forms the halides and lays them on the plate. So I probably put the plate in, pulled it out too soon, and created had a little rivulet there that sensitized differently. That's all we're talking about, too little or too much. And, and it's hard to answer these questions without actually being there and, in fact, probably testing your chemistry, to be honest with you. But here's what Nathan Burgess says in, from 1858 um, on page 116. We'll look at this book today, too. Oily spots or lines up and down the plate. I know that's vague. I know. I know. Um, these occur when the plate is taken taken out of the silver bath before the ether and alcohol have been washed away. And that's what I said. If you guys want to play around with this and see what happens, pour a plate, let it just barely start to skin over, drop it in the silver bath, and once it goes down into the silver bath, immediately pull it back up. Don't even let it sit there and keep it out for 20 or 30 seconds and then push it back down in, you're going to have all kinds of this, this problem show up on your plate. It's a, it's a double decomposition sensitization problem normally. Sometimes it's a developer. Sometimes, you know, it's usually happening. You can see how the plate is immersed in the silver bath. That's the telltale sign. <clears throat> Marks of the same shape occur also when the developer does not amalgamate readily. You, you, English translation there does not come in to contact properly for double decomposition to reduce those salts to silver iodide, silver iodide and silver bromide. So it does not amalgamate readily with the surface of the film, in which case add a little alcohol to the developer. So there's, I know it's vague, but if you play with this and you look at it in context of what we're talking about, you can recreate those problems if you want them. Um, most people don't want them, but you can recreate them. I, I've done it quite a bit. I hope that makes sense. I, I hope it I hope it does anyway. Hello, Jan. Uh, Jan's from Norway and Carlos. Hello, Carlos. Good to see you guys. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about these. These are just a couple of quick, um, uh, couple of quick little excerpts. I, I constantly read 19th century material. Constantly, every day. So here's my routine. I get up between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning and I spend about two or three hours answering emails and working on projects, uh, writing, reading, those kinds of things. So at the end of the day, I have a whole bunch of 19th century primary literature. Some are better than others. I pick the best. And when I run across something that I feel is valuable to the community, I try to share it on here. So that's what I'm going to do. This is the same book. You can find it on Google Books. This is the same book we just quoted for the marks um, on the plate there in Burgess, Nathan Burgess. And this book was written in 1858. So the first thing I want to talk about is we've talked about leatherotypes on this show before. And if you if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar with them, here's what they are. 
glass, clear glass in the 19th century was very expensive. And, and black glass or color glass was even outrageously more expensive. But clear glass was very expensive. So a lot of times, and you know, let's keep in mind, most of the photographers worked in the commercial environment, right? I need to make money. How do I cut my costs? All those kind of business things. Um, so they work on the basis of finances, uh, profitability, all those things. So to give away a piece of glass, you know, in a large plate back in the day was like a half plate. That would have cost, you know, six months salary to have a portrait made like that. So to give away a glass plate that size would almost be unheard of. So what did they do? They lifted the collodion off the glass plate and put it on a leather piece of leather, right? But check this out, black leather. Cheap, inexpensive, readily available. Check this out. Read what this Burgess says to do, which is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Ambrotypes can be easily transferred from the glass plate to the surface of patent leather by the following process. Add 30 drops of nitric acid to two ounces of alcohol. That's 60, 60 milliliters of alcohol. And after the exposure is well dried upon the glass, pour enough of the alcohol prepared as above on the surface to cover it. Clean the Japan surface of the patent leather with a soft canton flannel only and pour over the alcohol two or three times. Then lay the leather upon the surface of the picture and place another glass over it, retaining the leather between the two glasses with the patent clothespins, right? They, they love this, patent clothespins, patent leather, Clamp, meaning you're clamping the glass and the leather together like this. Patent clothespins are in a manner to press the glasses evenly under these leather for about 10 minutes. They can be separated and the picture will leave the glass and adhere to the leather, which is, when dried can be rubbed without any possibility of removal. Isn't that fascinating? It's basically a transfer to black leather from the end. I, I just, I absolutely love it. So if you don't want to float it off and use the, use the chopsticks and that kind of thing, here's a little tidbit from Mr. Burgess, 1858. Um, I've got a whole list of things that I'm going to do when my dark room's back up. And this is what, this is on it. This is one of them. I really want to try this. I think it's fascinating. I, I just love it. So there's the patent leather process, a different version of it anyway. Look at this one, guys. Oh my God. Are you serious? How many emails do I get a week? My collodion is, I don't want slow collodion. When we talk about slow or fast, ISO, speed, right? ISO two or three or whatever. Well, look at this. Let's add two or three drops of iron iodide with alcohol for every ounce of collodion. And it'll make, it, 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 it will, <laughs> It will cause it to make the impression in the camera an incredibly short space of time. In fact, what he means there, you have your amount of collodion you're going to pour on the plate to make that image, and you've got some old red collodion. You can do this and add it to that collodion right before you pour it on the plate, and you'll jack your speed up through the roof. He claims this is just unbelievably uh, fast. So... Interesting little tidbit there. Um, iron iodide, potassium ferrous cyanide, potassium iodide, um, per, uh, ferrous cyanide. You, you, you can make it. Put it with some alcohol. And, and he says here, don't put it in your whole bottle, your poor bottle of collodion. It'll oxidize and, and denigrate and ruin your collodion. But just the amount you want to make on that plate, add it to that. Boom. There's your solution. If you don't want to use um, the old, uh, the old um, uh, NH4I, it, it goes bad too fast. It goes too red too fast and people can't use it. I happen to use a lot of it, so I don't have that problem, but some people do. So there you go. Uh, Jeffrey says, uh, 19th century literature. How do you know if the ones are valid and the other ones are fake news? That's a great question. Um, mostly by trying their experiments and seeing if they work or not. Uh, but sometimes it's just blatant. You know, some. I just read something something the other day. It wasn't extreme, but I knew it was completely off. It, it was like throwing you down the rabbit hole. It, it's very difficult to tell the difference. That's a great question. No, it's very difficult to tell the difference for sure. Um, and and a lot of times, if it's something really obscure, it goes really against.
what you kind of know and you've experienced and it throws up a little bit of a red flag, that's a pretty good way to determine, ah, I don't know. But at the end of the day, some things sound crazy, kind of like this, and, uh, and they end up working. Here we go. Here we go. Back to Gerard's question, or and many people's question about, oh, my God, I got uh, too much water in my alcohol. I got chambered lines. I've got all kinds of stuff coming off here. So this is how you remove water from mixed collodion. Does anyone know what saleratus is? You see, okay, let's read this. To remove water from collodions and to pu purify old collodion. A very simple method of removing water, which may be found in the collodion, is to add a quantity of common saleratus, well dried, shake it well, and allow it to settle. It will not only remove the water, but greatly improve the quality of the collodion. Many old collodions may be treated in this manner and greatly benefited. The quantity of saleratus necessary to add to the collodion is not, doesn't matter, it's not material. An excess will do no harm, but it is recommended to pour off from the sediment, the saleratus, into another bottle to allow it to become clear for use. The addition of albumin or an egg white to a quantity of collodion and allow it to settle is also of great benefit to it, especially if it has a tendency to remain thick and turbid. Any, any word on the saleratus? Anybody know what saleratus is? Sodium bicarbonate. Baking soda. You believe that? Baking soda. Who's putting baking soda in their collodion to get rid of their chambered lines? Never heard of it. So <laughs> very interesting, right? Uh, back to Jeff. Right method, by the way. What's that, Gerard? Uh, well, in fact, I did try to dry my ethanol that yep. I had used for well, when I had a problem. And I used molecular seeds. Okay. You can buy them in uh, uh, oh, large quantities on eBay. They're not very uh, expensive. Molecular sieves, by the way. And yep. they absorb the water, but They're not the ethanol. And it would just work very good. Yep. They're hydroscopic. Okay. Exactly. Yes, that's correct. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah. Well, here, here's, here's one of Jeffrey's questions. Who's willing to try this? Uh, uh, we could try it with a little bit of collodion just to see, right? You can't overdo it, he says in there. So it'd be really interesting if, Gerard, you took a little bit of the amount of that collodion that's giving you those chambered lines, like the images we just looked at, and try a little baking soda in it. See if it gets rid of those. That'll it'd be interesting to see what happens. And then he's just totally sold on the white of an egg. Let it just let it settle, and just it, he just totally believes in that one. So. <clears throat> Dilution of the iodide of iron. Let's let's look at that, Pablo. Let's look. Uh, let's go see what that is. Um, he's talking. Pablo wants to go, but I didn't catch Pablo's question. Um, two or three drops of solution of iron iodide in alcohol to every ounce of iodized collodion. So, I that's a great question. What I would take from there, Pablo is if I had twenty mils of collodion that I wanted to pour on a plate and I wanted to jack the speed up of that, I'd take probably five mils, three to five mils of alcohol, and put two or three drops of iron um, iodide in it and see. Experiment and see. Uh, it, it, that would probably do it. But what you're doing is you're just – I mean, it does make sense in my mind chemically. Uh, it's really strange that you would add that um, directly into the collodion. Again – don't add it to your main pour bottle, only add it to the amount you're going to use for the plate. That's really important because obviously that will oxidize like crazy. But good, good point. Not really clarified, you know, not really clear on how much alcohol and, and two or three drops is clear. But um, I, I, would, I would go as little as I could and then go from there. <clears throat> and one more thing here. Let's talk about the strength of the nitrate bath. Um, the last and highly important imperfection is often caused by the want of silver in the bath. So I've gotten three or four emails just this week about feeble images, weak images coming out um, of, of uh, people's dark, uh, studios, dark rooms, dark boxes, whatever. They're making weak images, and they're wondering why I just topped off my silver, or I just made new collodion, or 
they, they did something like that, and this is why. Lastly, often caused by the one of silver, a weak bath is indicated by certain parts of the plate having the appearance, appearance of, transparent, uh, of transparency as though no collodion was upon its surface. Test the bath with a hydrometer, ascertain the quantity of silver, and add enough to render the quantity equal that to that required for the collodion. To be used generally 50 grains to every ounce of water. There are perhaps many other imperfections in the negative process, which were they fully enumerated here, would tend most likely to mislead rather than give information. Exactly. Um, so here's another emphasis on balancing the type of collodion, how iodized your collodion is and how strong your silver bath is and the pH of your silver bath. Very, very common problem. I think three times this week I've got gotten emails like that. Hola, good morning, La Photo Galleria. Good to see you. So anyway, there's the uh, there's the uh, bottom line of some tidbits of information from the 19th century. And again, I read these books almost every single day, and I just pick out good information or something that's unique or something that's if it's right. Sometimes not, but sometimes there is. This week there just happens to happen to be a few of them. So. Any questions on any of that? Um, you can come back to it, you know. Hey, Sasha, my bro, my bra, as we say here, right? Yeah, so let's do this. Uh, we'll have, we can have, you can drop any technical questions anytime throughout the show. But let's move into a different piece of the show here and look at uh, people's work. Um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put this full screen. And I'm going to let Demetrios get in here. You can unmute yourself, Demetrios, and, and just introduce yourself and tell us about who you are. Hello. Um, I'm Demetrios. Uh, I'm from Cyprus. I'm 35 years old, uh, almost 35. Um, I started doing wet plates. Actually, I, I was a photographer since I was 18, but I, I did my first plate three years ago. Um, I couldn't find any cameras, I couldn't find any chemicals, so I, I made everything myself. Uh, I make, I, I build my own cameras. And uh, as for chemicals, even though they're very expensive here for, um, uh, especially collodion, it's uh, around 150 euros per liter. And, uh, I have to buy everything and mix my own uh, chemicals. Um, I don't know. That's it for now. Uh, I like uh, doing uh, horror and dark uh, shoots. And my subjects are mainly mental health, uh, social acceptance, um, bullying, uh, fat shaming, anything. Uh, it has to do with uh, mental health anyway. Excellent. Yeah. I, I noticed, I noticed uh, the uh, heavily, I, I connect with this type of work just for the sen in the sense of my own personal interest in othering and marginalized communities and the work that I've done. So this is going into the emotional side of things. So let's flip through some of your work and you can talk about some of it here. And yeah. See, see what you think. So there's his Instagram. Uh, you guys can catch that and look at his stuff there as well too. But just talk about each one of these as we go through them. Um, this is um, a girl um, I know locally from Cyprus. She lost her leg uh, in a car accident. She wasn't. She was the pas She was a passenger. She wasn't driving or anything. And uh, she spent uh, around six to seven years hiding and trying to hide the fact that she doesn't have a um, leg and she has a prosthetic. And um, but obviously everyone knew because I live in a very very small society. And. Cyprus is a very small island, but uh, it was kind of a taboo for everyone to talk about, or even for her, it was very hard for her. 
and uh, finally a few years ago she accepted it and came out uh, and now she she works with uh, with the prosthetic leg um, showing so she doesn't try to hide it or anything and this is how I portray um, her coming out I mean uh, she was hiding but she came out from the hiding spots and now it's herself and the mirror is just a mirror for society and how you know we all see ourselves in pictures of strong people because we want to be strong yeah it's interesting I, um yeah i saw that it was a mirror here and, and my first my visceral re my, my immediate reaction was man it looks like she had both of her legs are gone no it's one yeah <laughs> yeah both of both now both of her legs are gone well yeah. yeah that's what the picture says but one leg is gone um that's why I put her behind the mirror. The leg that's uh, her right leg is uh, okay, but it's behind the mirror. But this picture shows like she's floating and she doesn't need both her legs. Yeah, I get. I yeah. get. Demetrius, did you ever see the photograph or photographs that I made? And there's even a video I made of a woman called Miriam. Uh, I've seen a lot of your work, but uh, yeah, which one? Uh, well, this one should really resonate with you. She's an amputee, mm -hmm. and she lost her leg from this uh, streptococcal uh, bacteria, streptococcal B or A, I think, the flesh-eating bacteria. She yeah. Stripper, and she was dancing, and uh, and I photographed. It's interesting because it kind of reminds me of this. I photographed just her wheelchair, right? She can't walk. And oh, I yeah. I photographed just her wheelchair, and the reason I did that was because she told me the first thing people see is her wheelchair when, when, yeah, that's... She, when she comes into a restaurant or she goes somewhere the first thing people notice is the non-human element of that human being which is her wheelchair which i thought was profound well, yeah that's exactly what happens yeah if you have a prosthetic or anything yeah that's that's what, that's what it reminded me of yeah exactly, exactly. interesting and let's just talk technically here just real quick. Um, your work kind of invokes a little bit of the Sally Mann-ish kind of thing, right? The whole, the whole lack of technical um, want or care or whatever, or purpose, you know, on purpose. It just I, on purpose. I, I really like the rough uh, image wet plate gives. I don't really care of giving a very clean image if i what i say is if you want clean images shoot digital <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got a point there here's a question here's a question someone might ask you and i'll just throw it out there can you make technically strong plates if you want yeah of course i've got clean plates okay okay yeah good but good good yeah because because somebody might might ask you about that Actually, no i've I've got clean plates and I've got dirty plates and it, it all depends on my context yeah context exactly. and intention I always yeah. say this guys it's all about context and intention so if you present an image not like Demetrios is doing here but if you present an image that you're basically putting forth as a commercial image Demetrios's work is, is his own personal, his, his fine artwork. He has all the liberty in the world to do whatever he wants with it, right? But if yeah. you're presenting images as commercial work, there's a certain context there. You're going to look at that image in, right? You're going to look for the cleanliness. You're going to look for the, uh, the, 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 the technically prowess image, the, the, the technical prowess there, the technical, what, what's the English word? I'm, the, the technical ability. So depending on what you're looking at, you know, people don't look at Sally Mann's work for technical uh, perfection. They work at it, look at it for the context and the visuals, the the semiotics, right? You know, semantics, words, semiotics, visual, the semiotics, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, the semiotics of the image, what the image is saying visually uh, in the context of how the artist made it. So I get it anyway. Yeah. 
I want to go on. Uh, if, um, I've got commercial work on my Instagram that's wet plate and they're clean as, uh, <laughs> yeah, as Perfect. they can be. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's not the issue. If, when, I, when I'm working for myself, I want, I want dirty, I want yeah. this thing. Yeah. And, and that's fair. That's, that's a fair, and that's all done in... Yeah. There we go. This is a cleaner version. We'll, it's not really cleaner, but it's still cleaner than the other one. And this image shows that um, it's like she's thrown her prosthetic leg and she looks at you in the eye and she's, it's like she's saying, I'm, I'm ready to do anything and I don't need uh, a prosthetic leg. And of course... Yeah. You know, the, you know the, what the first thing, you, uh, we'll talk about this word punctum. Anybody ever heard of punctum? Studium and punctum, if you've read mm -hmm. Bartas, no? Um, we're, we'll, I'll turn you on to that in a minute. Uh, All right. The punctum in Demetrios's image here is her hand, her left hand or the right one as we're looking at. It. Look at the position of her hand, you see that? She's trying to keep her balance and that hand shows that. That hand shows the pressure of her and her face shows that, that same pressure of her trying to overcome her handicap or overcome her marginalization. Just like Demetrio said, to me, it's an image that's coming out and she's talking about, um, yeah, punctum. Somebody wrote punctum on the Facebook page. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But that's the punctum in this image. This one really reminds me of the Merriam image. Dealing with otherness and dealing with marginalized people when you're not marginalized yourself is a very difficult thing to do but it, she looks strong here she looks yeah i, I get uh, where you're going this is a 12 second exposure and uh we failed like four times because she fell down but she wanted to the shot so we go. kept doing hand. yeah that, that is the punctum yep that, that is the punctum that is awesome uh, good 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 um okay there um we go. yeah <laughs> this is uh this has a nice story behind it too um this i was inspired by uh even personal um uh suicidal thoughts and uh, from people i know that have suicidal thoughts and uh, this is actually my my point on how everyone trains and uh, tries to fight their own suicidal thoughts. This is this girl is uh, who is actually a professional boxer um, is training, and her her actual, actual training sack is herself who committed suicide and she's fighting that thought um, that's what I wanted to show with this image that uh, uh, even though she looks very thin and uh, weak she's not and her posture is correct and she she looks strong but her body is not strong uh, but she's fighting it and uh, well, the funny story is that I did this on a public road and the police came and they told me that uh, they had cause of uh, someone committing suicide because that girl over there is an actual girl <laughs> that uh, we hanged there. She's alive. Uh, but yeah, I almost got arrested for this shot, but it was I, I worth she's it. Alive and <laughs> she's, she's alive, she's fine, yeah. yeah, good, yeah. We, we, I think we assumed that, we figured that. Yeah. Um, this is this is a 60 by 50 plate so imagine i i carried a huge camera in the middle of the uh, of the uh, cyprus to uh, larnaca to nicosia street a huge uh, street very busy and uh, we shot this and uh, they thought that we have killed someone yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so for for the uh, americans and the non-metric people uh, did you say 40 by 50 centimeters? 60 by 50, so oh, 20 so by 24 inch. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, there you go. 20 by 24 inch. So, so you guys understand now the size of plate he's working with here, which may, it's important to understand the technical and all that stuff too, as well as we're going through this. Um, um, <laughs> so you're, you're getting comments. You can read your comments in here in the chat there. Um, oh, I um, see. But, oh. 
Um, and also, yeah, Linda. Hi, Linda. Very strong image with the hand. Thank you. Linda. I love it. Um, oh, here's 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 the comment. We talk about punctum in my class when we read Cameron Lucida. Yeah, <laughs> but it's also just a great word to say. Picture is yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, punctum. But yes, beautiful, beautiful story. Um, I love the idea of you constructing that narrative that it's herself coming against her own thoughts of suicide, which is a, you know, it's a tremendously, it's a huge problem. And now even, I just read an article the other day since uh, COVID and all these lockdowns and people are really struggling with mental health and mental health is the, you know, is the basis, you know, we are already have a huge problem with it as, as human beings. But at the end of the day, um, you conveying that narrative and, and talking about this, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, there's a, there's Jan. Excellent work to meet Thank you. Pictures and stories. Yes, good, good, good. Um, let's go back over, and we'll go to this last one. Yeah, um, this is a friend I made. Um, uh, Andreas came from uh, Denmark a few years ago in Cyprus to work here, and uh, he was. Uh, two meters tall and he was a bit over 200 kilos and um, he was marginalized by everyone because he was fat and because people didn't really like him and I met him in an internet cafe he was sitting in the corner he was alone and he was just uh, playing online and no one actually wanted to sit next to him it was very tough uh, to watch because you know uh, him being uh, overweight, of course, he had a strange odor, which I didn't mind. So I approached him and we talked and we, we said a lot of things. We, we talked and we talked and we met again and again. And we, play, we kept playing and it was like I, I had that spot, uh, hit the spot next to him. It was always free, so I could go there and... Um, just uh, be with Andreas and uh, it turns out he was marginalized in his work uh, where he used to work in a call center and everything he was uh, he was very alone and when he came here he found some uh, people to live with but they kicked him out because they didn't like his lifestyle he liked of course anyone has his own reasons to be overweight he liked food so he ate a lot he didn't care he was happy to play his games and he was happy to talk to anyone so one day he comes to me and he says i can't handle it i have to go I'll go back to denmark i need to seek uh, help and everything and i told him you can't leave without showing how strong and uh, how much courage you have for actually um standing up of, of who you are and uh, he I told him I need to make a portrait of you and he said we'll make a portrait but um, I I, I want to show how fat I am <laughs> that's what he said so I told him yeah whatever of course um, and he stood there he gave me that look I took the shot that's it I, I didn't I didn't even guide him to how or what. He just saw me like that and I told him, please don't breathe, I'll take the shot, that's it. And, and he left for Denmark and I haven't heard from him. He sent me a few emails, but I don't, I haven't heard from him in a while, so I don't know his situation, if he's okay or even if he's alive, which is uh, kind of sad. But I'll always has, I'll, I will always have Andreas <laughs> yeah. uh, with me because I'm, I've been asked to sell this plate actually and uh, I, I declined the offer because, I don't know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's someone I met and I'll, I'll probably never see in my entire life. And this is another 60 by 50 centimeter portrait which is 20 by 24 inches. Interesting. Yes, you can, you can see he's he's a very vulnerable person. I mean, you look at look at his face. I mean, just he's just he's vulnerable. That's just the 
you know, one of the things that collodion process can do, because uh, normally the exposures are quite long, and it's usually the first plate if you're doing portraits, it's a powerfully, it's so powerful, the emotion that comes out of people before they actually understand what's going on, and unlike mm -hmm. pulling a digital or a film camera up, um, they don't know what's going on on that first plate. You can tell, yeah. look, look at his eyes, look at his expression, he's completely vulnerable. Uh, mm -hmm. Very, very bold to do this. You know, being overweight, uh, I, I, you know, I've lost, you know, a hundred. Yeah, miles. you've lost, lost a lot. A lot of weight, a lot of <laughs> yeah. weight. Yeah. Um, not quite 200 kilos, but um, um, it, it is difficult to have weight and, and, and have people take you seriously or look at you in a, in a certain way. And that's, that's with all the privileges, right? I mean, yeah. um, oh. Will, Will says, love how it is very recognizable style. Something I wouldn't just scroll by and not make any mental notes. Powerful. Good deal. Thank you. Great comment, Ron. Um, um, just for the uh, people of uh, the USA, 200 kilograms is 440 pounds, which is... Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, he was a big man, but uh, he had a huge heart. So, yeah. yeah, and you can see it in the picture. Also, um, this is one of the only images I've done a bit of tilting um, just to blur uh, his uh, just to blur his body a bit this has a bit of um, shame flag uh, but I don't really do much technical if my subject is strong I try to just uh, capture the subject but yeah I had to do some shame flag here because why not? It was yeah, yeah. No, it's it's. It. I, uh, I I would love to hear what he thought about the image. You know. I oh, know. he he loved it. He he was. That's great. That's yeah, great. He was, I mean, he was stoked. Yeah, he was really oh, proud. That, yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> that that is great. That, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really good to to get to know people like this. Um, um, very intimate kind of setting. Uh, I photograph many, 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 many people, and rarely uh, it's not kind of an emotional thing to go through with people, uh, especially if you're doing work like this, you know. All right, uh, you guys jump in here and ask some questions for Dimitri. Dimitrios, uh, ask him anything yep. you want to do there. Jump in here. You can for you guys on the panel here. You can unmute yourself and ask or type in the chat or whatever if you have questions or comments let Demetrios know it's it's really difficult to come out in public and, and show your work and talk about your work because everybody's got an opinion you know everybody yeah, has of their ideas about what you should or shouldn't do or how you do it Demetrios well, it was... um, Jeffrey says were you able to send a copy of the play to Andreas uh, he has uh, he has a, a full uh, quality picture, of course, of him. I sent him on his email a huge tiff, but I wanted to send him a print, but I can't get a hold of him at the moment. That's interesting. I'll try <laughs> again. Uh, but it's been a while since we had a chat. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Demetrius, are you putting together a body of work on this topic, or are you ex just exploring it? Are you. Tell, tell, give us fill in the blanks a little bit about what you're actually going to do with the work. Well, um, I I'd love to do an exhibition at some point, but um, because uh, some of my pictures um, are um, interpretations of uh, my own personal demons, it's kind of hard to actually show um, my work. I mean, this is the first time I've ever shown my work and uh, I've talked about my work in my life. Uh, even though I'm a photographer for so many years, um, I don't really have the courage yet. <laughs> well, we, but, uh, we appreciate you sharing it with us. Then. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, but uh, I've been asked to uh, do uh, exhibitions and uh, stuff, but 
I'm always kind of busy with everything, so uh, I will exhibit yeah, well, at some have, point, you, you of course. Have little, you have a little exhibition here anyway, so that's a good Yeah, thing. that's, that's <laughs> very good. Yeah. So there's a Facebook user question, Demetrios. Why did you choose on the image of the last image, choose to almost blur the person's body? Why did you choose to frame him a bit smaller in the frame as opposed to being up closer to the uh, probably actual size or accent accentuate size yeah. in the frame? Yeah, I guess so. Um, okay, I I chose to blur because um, <laughs> anyway, Instagram wants to blur nipples, so why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. That, that was uh, yeah, and because when something's blurry, is something that people don't want to look at. So it's like um, people didn't want to look at Andreas. They didn't like him because sorry, because he was a big guy. He he had a very big body, and uh, it's like that part of his body wasn't pleasant to the eye. Uh, that's why I chose to blur, and uh, that's that's how I thought at that it's, point. Basically, and, Demetrios, if you know, if you if you're familiar with the um, artist um, uh, Nan Golden, yeah, Nan Golden, she's got she she published a work called "I'll Beat Your Mirror," and mm -hmm. a lot of times I use that same metaphor. What I do in my photographs is I'm showing back to the public the very thing that they feel that they're disgusted or don't like, yeah, right? Exactly. So yeah. you put it right back to them, you turn the tables around. And yeah. what, I what I love about work like this, some people may find it offensive or they don't like it, but what I love about it is the artist or photographer that makes this kind of work in the proper context with the proper intention, um, is it? It's it's showing back, it's making, it's forcing the viewer to look at something they don't want to look at, right? It's a it's a type of uh, it's a type of uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, like exposure therapy, right? When you're talking yeah. about therapy, right? So I like that idea of forcing people to address and deal with things they don't want. I think blurring the image that way, those reasons and context, that's that's interesting. But at the end of the day, I just like that number one. He was um, um, willing to do this, and number yeah. two, that, that you have the context to talk about it in. And yeah. Linda um, says, great images, very personal. You can feel what the feel. I, I agree. I also like the images with the artifacts. There you go. Thank you. And Will says, do you have any pictures of the camera you built? Oh. Yeah, of go. course. I've, um, I've got. Them all over Instagram and uh, okay, yeah, so go to his yeah. Instagram page. There you go. Um, I, I, I also have a question that I haven't answered, and also I want to say, um, what you said about people not wanting to see uh, two years ago, I uh, no, one year ago, when I posted the first picture of the girl with no leg, um, I had a Facebook account back then, I don't have now. I, I had a public Facebook account with my name and everything and when I posted that picture I saw that um, some users of Facebook chose to hide that image from uh, their wall which is uh, which is sad because people chose not to see the reality they chose they, they kind of reported my image as um, you know, not something they wanted to see. So people are just hiding behind their finger and they think that uh, life is always perfect. And uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, you know what, Demetrius, you know what I'd say? This is how I'd phrase it. This is what I'd, if I'll give you a little fodder from my own well here. I'm gonna dip into my own theoretical well and give you some fodder. Um, if you take the time and you go and read The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, you're going to quickly understand why people take that image away from their wall, why they don't want to look at it, why they push you, give you feedback. And it's, it deals with their own impending death. 
their anxiety of their impending death. And what yeah. you're doing by showing them that image is you're crushing that illusion that they have about not thinking about their own death. In other words, what some of these images do, they conjure up the idea of people's impending death and it, it makes them do crazy things. I mean, crazy not just taking it off their wall or hiding the image, but internally. That's why we have yeah. the war, that's why we have genocide. Once you come against me and you threaten my own beliefs about how the world should be and how I put in place these these uh, walls to keep stave off the anxiety of death, once you start penetrating, and I think art should do that, I think art should break those walls down. Once you start breaking those walls down, I'm going to become very defensive. I'm going to yeah. start lashing out at you. Uh, if I can't convince you to come over to my side, I'm going to eliminate you. Right? Exactly. That's yeah. the idea. So we're doing that visually here. So very good points and very good, um, very good, uh, basically, uh, yeah. a commentary about yeah. otherness and death anxiety in my and, and the last thing. Um, he, um, Wait a minute, because I'm still. Facebook user asked, "Why did you choose to frame him a bit smaller in the frame as opposed to being closer?" Uh, I like the darkness around him. That's all it is. Very good. And then that same, <laughs> yeah. the same Facebook user said, "That would might be nice to make those details a bit clearer and confrontational." I I, I understand what what this user is saying. I'm interested yeah. in the choice as well, but it makes me think of Jenny. So if you, yeah, paintings and how she confronts the viewer. With a very corporal, fleshy, visceral fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. I get um, it. Hey, there's Paul. Hey, hey Paul. Paul. Yeah, denial of death. Yeah. Uh, uh, Demetrios, where any work that deals with othering, any marginalized communities, anything about that, that w where we have human conflict, where you're showing work that's uncomfortable for other human beings to see, is usually. Mm -hmm dealing with their own death anxiety. So it is a very interesting um, uh, topic to talk about in the sense of uh, um, having, you know, having your uh, your own beliefs challenged that way. Wonderful. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Anything else for Demetrios? We're, we'll uh, thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, it you're, you're lot. welcome to come back anytime. Of share course. Some more stuff that you've done. If you put a body of work together, if you want to share some, just it doesn't have to be three. It doesn't have to be. You can come on and share one. It doesn't matter. You yeah, know. of course. Yeah. Well, as I said, now I'm kind of busy with. Um, uh, I'm trying to break a Guinness record. I'm, I'm. I'm not actually trying to break the Guinness record, I'm trying to start people actually pursuing doing bigger plates and bigger plates and I just uh, finished a huge camera and uh, it's going to be an official uh, Guinness uh, attempt it's going to be a 2x1.2 <laughs> two two meter Ambrotype and it's a huge camera so I'm kind of busy with that right now, I'm trying to make like 30 liters of silver nitrate and blah, blah. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I, I work, uh, I try to balance everything out, but I'll be around and I'll, I'll come back, of course. Yeah, uh, what, yeah. I got a question. Why, why are you trying to convince people to make larger plates? Uh, because they're impressive and you know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, hey, Demetrios, let me tell you yeah. my theory about this, okay? I have zero against large plates. I've made one or two myself. Um, here's my thing about that. The size and the format plays in the same context and intentions of everything else, right? Yeah, of so, course. Yeah. So, so, so my theory is this. I've had quarter plates. You know, little tiny quarter plates and in galleries and large 40 by 50 plates in galleries. And you know what I see the viewers do? I see the viewers back up off the large plates <laughs> and come in tight on the small plates. And I love that intimacy. I love that yeah. interaction, right? So if you have good reasons to make large plates, if you're doing commercial work or you're uh, you're doing, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, emulating, you know, beer shots paintings or, you know, whatever, you know, I don't know what you might be doing. I just, I just like the pain and the agony. <laughs> hey, you know what? You know what? You, 
can write the ritual and the process and the ceremony into that, right? Yeah, of course. You don't. You don't have to. I mean, there, there, it's a difficult line. It's a difficult edge to walk when when because because there's so much ego involved in this process, right? We all know. We just went through one the other day on Facebook on ego <laughs> and. And, and photographers trying to gain attention by doing these kind of markety weird things. Um, yeah. If they want to do that, I don't care. They can do that. But when we talk about artists and photographers making work, we're talking about someone who's thought through everything and and, and can defend that work and defend. Maybe, maybe the the, the uh, maybe your interlocutor, your 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 debate partner, won't like the answers that you have for what you're doing. But at least you have the answers, right? So, yeah, of course. So, so I understand. I love big plates too. I probably won't make any more big plates, to be honest with you. I don't know, but right now I'm, but I, I'm just always curious about people making to large be, plates. To be honest, my favorite size is eight by ten inches. I there can shoot eight by ten inches all day long. But there you go. I, I have, I have the capacity. I have the strength, and I have the knowledge to make bigger plates and bigger plates than. Why not? I might shoot three huge plates in my life and the thousand eight by ten. Yeah. But at least I'll know that I've reached my limits, and because I like limits, and uh, I like to see how far I can go with. Yeah, yeah. The human, the, our, our human beings, constantly want to push the envelope. Yeah, of course. It's part of our death denial, right? Oh, if exactly. It's, it's part of our death denial. We push I, limits. We put, We want more money to buy more stuff. We push limits. We go bigger. We go bigger. We go to mo the moon. We go to Mars. We go and go and go and go. That's part of that death denial syndrome. But at oh. the end of the day, whatever reason you choose to do whatever size of plate in whatever medium or whatever processes, I always recommend that um, you can come back with a, uh, your own authentic personal answer for the choices you make, whether it's size, whether it's process, whether it's yeah. content, anything. And uh, I get it. I understand what you're saying. Thank um, you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Demetrio. Thank you, Quinn. We, we, uh, we definitely appreciate you coming on and doing that. And I definitely and, appreciate you having me. <laughs> absolutely. You're welcome, yeah. my brother, anytime. Okay. We're going to jump over. I'm going to ask Gerard to unmute himself, and let's uh, let's look at his beautiful um, ideas and work. Um, here, here's his email um, that you just you sent me. He's got four portraits. Uh, two of them are obviously religious, um, and the other is a portrait of a young girl and her Mona Lisa smile. That's the one I use for the back. Just an absolutely gorgeous portrait of her. Uh, very emotional. Very moving. And then the last one with the watch is inspired by the story of Rasputin. You go ahead and take the floor. Um, do you do you pronounce your name Gerard or Gerard? Yeah, yeah that, that's perfect, Gerard. That, that's Gerard. The, usual okay. way, uh, the usual way they pronounce it in America. Because yeah. if I pronounce it the Dutch way, uh, it's almost impossible for other people to... Uh, well, well, give us the Dutch way, Gerard. 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 Yeah, Gerard. but that's almost impossible to pronounce for people outside of Holland. <laughs> well, thank you, Val. But okay, uh, first of all, thanks for having me uh, around to show my work. Uh, obviously, I'm Gerard. I live in the Netherlands. I'm 56 years old. And uh, five, six years ago, I started getting interest in wet plate and the reason was of course i was intrigued by the way it looked you know and the artifacts and by nature i am a perfectionist you know i want everything clean and i want it uh, straight but the problem is this is holding me back <laughs> because to reach uh, perfection is very hard you put the bar very high and it limits you in in your expression you know and what wet blade wet blade does for me is that uh, it helps me to accept the artifacts the errors that occur and by doing so i can uh, make things and shoot plates that i usually wouldn't do because uh, I would want to have a perfect image. 
And uh, well, that's a waste of your time, of course. So I started five, six years ago. I bought a camera, I bought more cameras, I uh, bought chemistry, I do everything myself. I don't buy anything ready-made, I don't like it. I, I like that aspect of the work, you know, the chemical aspect and knowing what is happening and if something goes wrong, uh, why that is happening and how can I solve it. I think those are very interesting aspects of this medium. And there's so much to learn, you know, also in the old literature that you showed earlier today. But uh, I am very interested in uh, making portraits, you know. I can take my time with people. Uh, I don't work commercially. I don't sell my work. Uh, usually I make more plates and the person that poses for me that he gets a plate and I have my pick. And I can take my time, I explain what I do. And in advance, I already have a picture in my mind of how I want to picture that person, you know? Like for instance, in this case, this is uh, Lars. He is from, uh, from Norway and he has been a colleague of mine. And the way he looked and dressed often reminded me of, uh, the images that you sometimes can see in pictures of Rasputin. And we chose to make this image with, uh, with a watch that he has in his hand to show the passing of time. Isn't that interesting, Gerard? Um, when I think of Rasputin, I think of, you know, and for those of you that don't know who Rasputin was, he's a Russian, um, um, Oh, uh, let's just say uh, he was a, a Russian with quite the reputation. But yeah. the first thing I, I noticed, you didn't leave any food in his beard to rot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like and, and, and notice, too, I want to point out something right away. And it's important what Gerard's done here. Um, speaking of the Dutch, the Dutch Vanitas, and look at what he's put in there. Look at that. Memento Mori, the time, right? Here we are back at death denial. Here we are back at the very core that we started to talk about, right? Everything revolves. And notice Gerard also talking about the ritual, also talking about incorporating chemistry and the ritual of that and the independence and how he works. It's a beautiful thing. When you start listening to people of, of how they're working, it's wonderful. But Rasputin, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh no, doesn't matter. I, uh, you have interesting aspects to, uh, to add to the conversation. Uh, why I added this image? Because it's far from perfect. There are flames and flow patterns in the image. And the reason that this happens, uh, well, let's start it different because it's, it's, it's a bit of a story. Uh, when I started, I had one bottle of acetic acid. And it stated on the label, this is 80%. So when that acid was gone, you know, I had to buy new, I bought again 80% acid. And the moment I used it, I got all kinds of trouble. Flow patterns, fog, everything, you name it. And luckily there was a little bit left of the acid in the old bottle. And what struck me is that if you smell uh, glacial 100% acetic acid is very pungent. It's right in your face. And the 80% that I bought, it was fairly mild. So my conclusion was that what they sold me, 80% in the first time, wasn't 80% at all, but was in fact glacial acetic acid. And the reason they do that is because if you want to send by post uh, glacial acetic acid, you have hazmat tariffs, you know, it's very expensive. So they put 80% on the bottle and then you have a problem if you do that uh, over yourself. But you can use it to your advantage because if you add little acetic acid and you get a hot developer, you know, it's very fast, it's not restrained, you can create flow patterns if you want to. And that is what I did here. It's a bit of a gamble. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's very ugly. But in this case, it's almost like he's on fire, you know? 
like the flames are in his face. Yes. Um, that was for me uh, an effect that I wanted to reach, in fact. It, if you look from it from a technical aspect, this would not, you wouldn't want to have this, but hey, you can use it to your advantage. So yeah, again, this is the beautiful thing. We're not talking about commercial work that you're shooting for some big corporation. We're talking about personal work that people are coming in and making for reasons. And if they, you know, embracing the artifacts, creating the artifacts, it's all relevant to what you're trying to do here. And you're trying to do something on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I love this guy. Is his name Lars? Yeah, Lars. I mean, he, he has got an intense, an intense look to yes. it. Yes. And uh, for him, it was a personal story as well. And that's a nice aspect. My side of the story that I tell about Rasputin, the, the passing of time, uh, that is not his story. Although the aspect of time is there, because he got that watch from his father who died the year before. Ah. And he wanted to show that in the image. So yeah. that was, uh, that's how that comes together, his idea and my idea of the image. It, that that time on the watch isn't the time that his father died, is it? Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no. No, I'm going to be honest about it. I'm not even sure if it worked. And uh, the nice thing is, it's quite hard to put an object in a, in a, in a portrait and have them both uh, sharp. Very you know? much so. That's the challenge. And uh, in this case, it worked uh, out very nice for, for my uh, perspective. I like this image very much. Well, you got tilt and swing. You can, you can work that large format to, to yeah. some degree. To, I mean, if you've got the watch way out here, you don't have to put the watch up to the eye level. You can, you no. can yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But in this case, I work with a 10 by 12 inch old wooden camera that does not have that many uh, possibilities yeah. to change. Exactly. Uh, to change this, this, is, this is one of the reasons I recommend people getting use a modern camera for yeah. rise and fall, tilt, shift, swing, all those. Because the pets full lenses or the vintage lenses are usually so limited that you want that other capability. So that's why I recommend the newer yeah. cameras. But I hear you. And well, that's all about I have to say about this image. In particular. Okay, here, here's a here's a couple. Uh, here's Joshua White. He says it also looks like a veil and makes me think about the thin veil between life and death, strengthened by the symbol of the watch. That's a very good comment. Yeah. That's a very yeah. good comment. Thanks. Very good, Joshua. We like that. Oh, and here's another one. I'm not sure. And part of the aura, although sometimes there's such an intimacy with those small plates. Have you invented a block and tackle system fire hose to coat the plate? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, that's good. And hello, Chris from Germany. Good to see you. That's a beautiful plate. Here we go. Um, yeah. Talk about her, would you? Yeah. This is uh, Lisa. And she's uh, a friend of my son, a girlfriend of my son, you know. And I really love this plate because she has a very – sweet expression and what i like to do is i like to make quite straightforward portrait the way i was taught in academy when i was younger uh, you use one light you use one reflection screen and you try to do it with that you know classical lightning uh, three quarters high you know it's it's not that difficult but what I like about this is the way uh, the compose uh, the composition worked out. I like the way that I cannot point that out, but her uh, clothes they they go on into her the line of her hair uh, at the short side of her face. I like that aspect very yes. much. Yes, and she has a very open face, a very yes. clean Mona Lisa like smile, and. Uh, sometimes I only make one or two plates and it's done, you know, I, sure. I, I communicate with that person. Uh, I tell my son, you know, go to your room and play your video game and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we can have a moment uh, together, you know, that she can open up and she can show herself without having uh, a problem with it, you know. 
Th yeah. these, these people must feel very comfortable with you, George, yeah. because yeah. at the end of the day, both of them have this, it, they're, they're almost painterly, right? They have this expression yeah. of just like, it, they're just super comfortable wherever they are. You're almost like a fly on the wall. And this young woman is, you know, we, it's very, I'm a frustrated painter. So I love painterly pets for lenses, shallow depth of field, very yeah. Caravaggio kind of look and feel and very, very intimate and very comfortable. She, she yeah. feels comfortable. Yeah. And that's also the reason why I spend a lot of time for a model. I usually, uh, they come at 12 o'clock and they leave at six. We eat together. I explain very carefully and easily with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, something to drink, what we're going to do. Because uh, being in front of a camera this big, you know, it can be quite intimidating for a yeah. So you have got to smelling all the chemistry, smelling all the chemistry, and you're over there with gloves on, and they're yeah. like, what, "What is this? I thought it was a photograph. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. I was getting surgery." <laughs> Most people don't real even realize that this still exists, you know, and and that's the nice aspect. All of the people I I photographer uh, I make image of, and I uh, run them through the process, and they look, and they are all always very impressed with what is happening, you know? They only know digital, you know? She's 16 years old. She has never seen an old camera before in her life. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And uh, I do like clean plates. You know, of course, that's, a, that's a, an inherent character trait of myself that I'm a perfectionist. So uh, yes, I do try, still try to make perfect images, but you still have flow patterns. You have the edges, you know? Hey, there's, and there's, I can accept that fact with Ambrotype. If I would make an, an image with a digital camera or, or even on film, I would find that unacceptable. But with Ambrotype, I can really embrace it. And I, I really love that aspect of Ambrotype. It sounds like the process has given you a lot of freedom in yeah, the photographic realm. Yeah. It really, yeah. really allowed you to um, feel good and feel comfortable about not being obsessive about you know, artifacts and flaws. Yes. I think everything not perfect. And you know, the you know the the Japanese have wabi sabi, right? This whole idea that things, the good and the bad, have to kind yeah. of be together, and it can be really beautiful and wonderful kind of thing. Um, I think. I mean, this is this is. Uh, I, I would be proud if I made this this portrait. You, you can tell that she's just. Uh, it's it's moving. It's very painterly. Like I said, anybody got anything on this? Let's see. Um, let's let's go over. Uh, okay, uh, we'll we'll keep up with these. This is this is wonderful, really really great stuff. And then there's these two. If you want to talk yeah. about these two, these two, uh, I always keep them together. They don't have a relationship in the sense that they know each other. They have never met. Uh, I'll start with. Uh, Let's be honest and open about it. The Jesus portrait. Uh, it was inspired by this painting. Oh, hold on, just a second. Just a second. By uh, Raphael. Oh, uh -huh. I saw it in real life. It's not a very big painting, but it's absolutely gorgeous. And I was very inspired by it. I'm not a very religious person, but history and religion are great. Uh, food for inspiration. So they sure have given us. They sure shaped the world, haven't they? Yeah. Well, uh, what I also like about the fact is that this painting, you know, uh, of course this is uh, Jesus, but this uh, the way what he does here is the same in Christian and in uh, in, uh, in uh, Islam. You know, you, they, you see it everywhere. And I find it a very uh, universal point, uh, way to keep the hand to point to God, you know. Uh, when I saw this person in real life, he's also a, a school friend of my son. The first time I saw him, he came into the door. He come, they come together They're on their bikes. They have their skateboards. And he walks in the door. This is uh, Ray, by the way. And the first thing I think, 
this is Jesus. You know, I must have an image of him. In fact, that took me two years to convince him to, uh, to be model for me, you know, and I, uh, I explained what we were going to do. You know, I showed him this image and uh, he liked it. He's, he saw the resemblance, the beard and the way he looks. And I've got to be honest, he did a marvelous job because he exactly knew what I was wanting to create, you know. And of, in this image, there are a, a few things that are, well, it's not comical, but it's sometimes very practical, you know. Sometimes it's, does, it's not necessary to uh, really make a thorn of crowns. In this case, it is just some branches of my garden, and the, 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 the needles are, in fact, the, the rest of the tie wraps that keep them together, you know. But it is the illusion that you create. Uh, a scarf is not a scarf, it's just a piece of bubble wrap. And his heart that you often see in, in the Christian paintings is in fact uh, from a Christmas tree. So it doesn't that's matter. Awesome, Gerard. It, that's, that's a great, great concept, I love to create the concept and the illusion. And in the end, everybody gets this, to, at least the people that I know who have seen this, they, they understand that concept everybody knows who this is you know and Powerful. yeah he, he did a great job he did a great all your sitters though yeah in fact i only made one plate this plate and yeah. we were gone and he knew it and they went off to, to the skate field again you know that's it <laughs> no hurry but yeah. this image that i love and the image next to it uh, yeah well maybe you could see her as maria i'm not sure I always keep them together because I like that they uh, they go together very well, you know? They do. Uh, this is a, a model who actually, she's a photographer herself and she wanted to see, uh, she wanted to see this process, you know? Yeah. So I made two shots. I made a beauty shot of her and uh, it's a beautiful shot, by the way. And you can see it on my Facebook page because it's, it's a little film that she made about it. She made a very good oh. film. Well, there you go. Promotional video. I'm still very pleased with that. And the beauty shot is in that image. And in this case, uh, she loves Morocco. She's been there. and She's very uh, crazy about that country, about the culture and, and being there. And the scarf she has on her head, it's just a scarf. And uh, it comes from Morocco. And... Uh, I just draped it all over her head to create uh, the illusion of a woman wearing a veil, you know, and it worked out very well. And it's almost impossible to see in reproduction how uh, detailed and how sharp and how nice the tones are in these images, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's it's that's it. what you can create. But we just like with, to get a reasonable facsimile. We get yeah. that for sure. Yeah. Even with a, even with a, uh, with a good scanner, you, it's very hard to capture that. Yeah. Yeah. So you really have to, have to see them together. L let me do two things here, Gerard. First of all, P P Paul says that's a that's the Trinity sign, right? The three, the, the Holy Trinity thing, yeah. the, the hand sign. Just FYI. And then Joshua, I, you know, he, he almost read my mind here. Listen to this. When you were describing those materials, I couldn't see that the heart was an ornament, but thought that the sash was bubble wrap. It made me think of the commodification of Christmas. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. I actually had the similar thoughts when you talked about the zip ties on the crown, the bubble wrap and the ornament kind of thing. It, 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 it kind of reeks of that, you know, which is a beautiful insight. If you didn't know any of that, you wouldn't get yeah. it. Yeah, excellent. Actually, when I first posted this photo on Facebook, uh, I referred to Ray as my bubble wrap prince. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And uh, yes, these images are very uh, representative of the work that I, that I like to make, you know? I like to make portrait work. I like to, uh, there are artifacts here. And sometimes I even get uh, the comment, or almost always, 
oh, you can take that away with a uh, with a wet cotton ball. I choose not to. You know, I do want to leave something of that originality in the image. Yeah, sure. Proof of process kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, for me, a stretch, I, I, you know, I don't know you. I only know you from our brief interactions, email or online or whatever. But um, when I see, and this is a small, this is three or four images, but I get the the feeling that you're you like to illustrate. You like to take not that you have a any kind of large narrative of the work, but you like to take little pieces and illustrate things and and kind of emulate and show little pieces back um, yeah. to the world, like these religious figures, um, um, just intimate portraits that you you may or may not have a deeper connection to. I'm not sure. But what I see from your work, just in this work, is that you're you like to illustrate. You like to craft and create and illustrate scenes um, that, uh, especially historical scenes like these. Uh, and then in, in the portraits, they're just more intimate friends and family kind of things. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Well, you couldn't be more. Uh, you couldn't be more correct. You know. Okay. Or, in, in fact, I I also make still lives. Okay. Know? Well, you're Dutch. You have to, isn't that the law? <laughs> yeah, but I don't make from here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking Dutch veneer. I should one day try to make a from here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, veneer. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, but uh, indeed, I like. I I'm often uh, inspired by uh, a books or by uh, say. Uh, a thousand miles below the sea, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I forget uh, the title of the of the writer. Uh, Fifty thousand leagues under the sea. Oh, uh, it will come. Oh, oh, the writer. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In still lives, I like to take a, a certain uh, motif uh, and create an image around that. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, Sometimes uh, you uh, you can talk to people, but it's quite superficial, you know. Yeah. And what I think that if you make a portrait of some somebody, and it doesn't matter if it has historic context or that it is just a, a good portrait, it really brings you closer together, you know. Sure. If you yeah. it again, it's always you you have that click because you have created something together, and that's also. A deeper aspect of making portraits, you know, you really have the chance to connect with somebody on a on a very personal level, you know. Yeah, and that's not that's nice about portrait. Yeah, and still life, yes, indeed, I like to take an, a, a certain uh, is it a historical fact or a book, and make an image that tells a story, you know. Exactly. Like, yeah. I try, I'm not just trying to make a portrait, but uh, I old. Of course, I also make uh, just regular portrait, but I often try uh, to recreate a certain uh, historical fact or uh, something that uh, struck me from uh, reading a book and yeah, yeah. to recreate that. And yeah. that's what I like about it. Gotcha. And, and Pablo, Pablo is touching on something I was curious about that I wanted to ask. Um, your, your choice of frames. Uh, may I ask wh yeah. uh, what you were after by choosing the old looking frames? Pablo asks. Yeah, well, that's that's very good because if you look at the background of me, you will see a lot of frames, you know? And uh, yes, it's almost uh, to the point of being kitsch. Uh, but uh, it's a very personal choice. Yeah. And I often have. Uh, among others, uh, with uh, Mark Osterman, I have had quite nice discussions about the use of my frames, you know? Yeah. Uh, I like uh, these old uh, old images. I, I like the fact that you, uh, you also use old frames. And I know that historically speaking, from a historical context, you often choose, they often choose uh, black or dark, uh, very sober frames that don't detach from the image. But for me, this frame is part of the image, you know? It's, it, well, it, it, why, why, why don't we touch on the fact that, that 
the three of these that you have framed up that you showed us, the Lars and then these two, yes, are very painterly. They're yeah. very painterly, and it's very European, right? It's very yeah. European. You know, Europe's got architecture and painting and all that great art, and America kind of has photography. So it's very European to treat photographs in a different way, depending on your cultural silo you live in. Um, and this just spoke to me. It said, yeah, of course, he's going to choose that, those types of frames. They're very painterly. They're, they, very, they very much go both in the context of the cultural context and of the content of the images, the process and everything. I, I think that I personally think they fit very, very well. Yeah. Well, if, if, for instance, to illustrate this, if you go to a church, you know, in uh, Antwerp, you know, the big uh, Roman Catholic churches, and you see the paintings, yeah, they don't have black frames. They yep. have frames like this. They are pompous. Gilded. Are, gilded frames, oh, absolutely. Uh, gilded frames. They are rich, you know. And that is what I'm trying to replicate here. That's also, if you, see this, if you see this picture in real, it doesn't have a black sober frame. It's yeah. gold, you know, puff right in your face. It's rich. It's Roman Catholic. It has ornaments. And that fits my style of work, you know. It does. But, I, I think you know, make good choices. But I do agree. Uh, I do have a, an image in the background here that I actually have two plates of the same because it's still live, so I can do that. And I indeed painted one frame uh, almost a dark gray and one normal and I have them often together next to each other and I'm still after a year figuring out which of the two I like best yeah although I tend to go to more like uh, what you see here on the screen the kind of uh, frames it's my personal choice and Oh, well, uh, I have the freedom not to be historically correct. If yeah, I no, absolutely. And that, that's your work. You present it the way yeah. you want. That's, that's really nice, Gerard. That's very, very, very nice. Um, yeah. Wonderful comments. Um, uh, Julia, Margaret, Cameron feeling. Yeah. But they also relate yeah. to the feeling of religious paintings with frames. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. Joshua White, you're on it, brother. Yeah. Any questions or comments for uh, Gerard? Um, let's see what we have over here. Uh, Samuel says, people are always calling me Jesus because of my beard and long hair. <laughs> that's, that's good, yeah. Um, wonderful stuff. I mean, really, really great, man. You guys coming, Demetrios and, and Gerard coming on today gave us a really nice really contrasting blend of uh, really wonderful map. I didn't do that on purpose. They both volunteered and I said, absolutely, come on. So I'm happy about seeing that. Thank you for that, Gerard. Those are yeah, that's nice. really beautiful. Me. So I was happy uh, to be able to show some work. Uh, oh, and you're welcome back anytime. You, anytime. Uh, uh, let's be honest, uh, the first book that I have, it's, it's an ebook, by the way, was the book that you have, uh, that's Chemical Picture. So I learned a lot from you. So oh, thank you. This is, in fact, a bit as the result of your work because I, everything I was taught in the beginning, I also often asked you questions and that you answered on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, well, uh, it has helped me very much, this information. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I do. And, I, and I'm, always ha I'm always happy to help anybody that I can. Um, I, and I'm, a, I'm always open to have discussions. I don't know why we have to be so, you know, closed about coming together and, and sharing some work and ideas, whether it's technical or conceptual or showing photographs. So I appreciate hearing that. Um, let's go. Uh, let's go over here. Uh, Herr Ketterman. I have a question, Quinn. I made me for oh, now I like the process very much in the print. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a different question. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, uh, very nice. Okay, here we go. Linda, very nice image. Frame and pictures go perfect together. I agree. Favorite is Lars. Yeah, it's something special with bearded men. <laughs> All right, Linda, that's awesome. <laughs> She's Swedish, so she should love uh, bearded and tattooed men. No. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much. It's good to see your work. It's good to finally kind of meet you in a, in a more, in, I know we're just virtual, but it's always nice to 
I think we can break a lot of this tension that people feel in the community by just kind of coming together. Hey, that, that, he's a nice guy. She's a nice lady. That's that's wonderful. They can talk and all that. There's weird things that go around out there that's not true about people and people that say they're mean. They're not really mean. Yeah, Vikings. Yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and uh, let's jump over here. Here we go. Recommended reading, right? What a beautiful contrast to come in and talk about Cameron Lucida. And if you have not read this book, please get it and read it. Um, no, it's not about wet plate. It's not about, it's about, in fact, it's loosely based on photography. Not really, but um, it is. These two words that I want you to remember here. And as if you read this, uh, studium describes the elements of an image rather than the sum of the image information and meaning. And punctum, the punctum. Remember the punctum in Demetrios's image? 12-second uh, exposure or hand. That's immediately my eye. I went there and I just I couldn't let that hand go. That balance, I could see that in her in her in her eye. So that's a punctum. Um, a punctum uh, of a photograph, however, contains a deeper dimension. The elements of a punctum penetrate the studium. They have the ability to move the viewer in a deep and emotional way. Studium refers to an enthusiastic commitment. Uh, Bartis writes in Cameron Lucida. I don't know how to, how do uh, French brothers and sisters or any any speakers out there, is it Barts, Barthus, Barts? I've heard all kinds of different pronunciations of Roland's last name, but um, if you have it, let me know. Um, <laughs> It's uh, okay. This is the initial attraction toward a photograph. It's what makes you stop and engage your eyes with what you're actually seeing. So studium is the first thing that drives you in. And then the punctum is where you find this, this mind burning detail, right? This like, Oh my God, there's something about that. Right. Um, it's what make you, your eyes stick to the photograph and opposed at glancing at something pointlessly. The studium indicates historical, social or cultural meanings uh, extricated via semiotic analysis. And, and not to go into big $10 English words, but semantics about words and semiotics about visuals, the semiotic analysis, the visual analysis. Punctum, plural puncta, don't you love that? Puncta, wow, I'd love to have some puncta in my plates. More than one punctum is a uh, puncta. That, you want more than one punctum. <laughs> anyway, my humor is terrible. Adjective pump tape. It's an anatomical term for a sharp point or tip. That's what it means in, in English. According to Bart's a punctum, which he defined as the sensory intensely subjective effect of a photograph on the viewer, the punctum of a photograph is that accident which pricks me, but also bruises me, is poignant to me. Isn't that beautiful? That's a beautiful, beautiful thing right there. Even if you don't speak English, maybe you could grab that and translate it into your language and, and see if it translates over. Um, this book, I highly, highly recommend you read. Uh, it gives you framework for looking at photographs, talking about photographs, which is really important. So few people spend time, they spend time making photographs, but they don't spend enough time talking about and, and thinking about and writing about their photographs or other people's photographs. So. Oh, uh, here's Joshua again. I have heard it mostly pronounced Bart. Yeah, that's usually the English version is Bart. Bar I've heard Barthus, Bart, Barthus, Bart. You know, I usually just say Roland B. How about Roland B? <laughs> kind of like the book I recommended, Flo. Remember that guy, Mr. C? His last name was like a long German word. I couldn't pronounce it either. Um Joshua also says the idea of Winter Garden photograph has stayed with me since graduate school when I first, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Highly recommend it. If nothing else, you'll, you'll uh, have some uh, framework um, for talking about and thinking about photographs. So that's my recommended reading. My recommended watching, if you haven't seen this film, you should see it. Again, it doesn't have anything to do with wet play but it's about Ray Johnson and it's about his, uh, uh, his life and death basically. But it is a fascinating story um, about basically he's the guy that started this uh, 
uh, mail art, right? This whole um, sending art around via post. Um, and you can watch the whole video for free right on Vimeo. Vimeo.com uh, forward slash, if you screen capture that number, you can type that in and watch the whole thing. It is worth an hour and a half of your time or an hour, whatever it is, because it, it's just a beautifully well-made art uh, film documentary about an artist and very deep conceptual ideas and very mysterious too. There's a lot of, it's almost like a, a drama film in a lot of ways that way. So ladies and gentlemen, that is us today. We went an hour and 40 minutes. Thanks for hanging with us. Um, I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time coming in and thank you again, the, the guests today showing their work. It, it takes a lot of, uh, as we say, chutzpah. It takes a lot of, oomph, a lot of gumption to, to come on and show your work to the world and have it live on the interwebs forever. So I greatly appreciate that. If you guys have any questions, Comments, concerns, send them to me this week, wetplate at gmail.com. Um, technical, conceptual. If somebody wants to come on next week and show work, please do. Um, I'll get you arranged and wind up. And uh, I did, no, Arnold, I did not start an hour earlier. Oh, you know what? I am so sorry about that. You know, Arnold just brought up, a, yeah, the daylight savings time change. I'm sorry about that. I should have said something so now is it what's the central european time now 1700 or 1800 is it 1800 hours there in europe yeah, yeah, before. yeah. okay okay yeah I'll be, right. sure, I'll be sure to change that i'm i apologize Arl. that's a very good oh, no, it's no problem we have you to kind of yeah and bogus law, came, bogus law came in a little bit late too I, I i apologize for that next week will be we did start an hour early i didn't even notice the damn time change i, I hate that stuff I, there's laws now in america we're trying to pass to stop doing that there are a few states that don't even have that you know so but crazy i, I apologize next week come in at is, is it 1800 or 1900 hours i can't remember 1900 hours central european time i believe is 10 a.m okay uh, mountain standard time over here in the states so we'll make sure i'll get the time right for you thank you so much for joining me i appreciate it you guys have a great wonderful rest of the weekend stay safe stay healthy and stay happy and we'll see you next saturday okay. thank you bye -bye. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye. So bye. 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 thank you, you. Have a good day. you guys are great you guys are great. Wonderful group. <laughs>